Good morning. I'm Garth Clark. I'm here at Peter's Projects on the occasion of the opening of Ars of Asorum, a really extraordinary exhibition. And again, I say it's an extraordinary exhibition not because I'm the curator, but because of the artists. There's over 100 pieces upstairs. Uh, and it celebrates what is probably the most banal object in ceramics aside from the ashtray, which is the flower vase. And when you go up there and you see what people have done and how they've thought about it, it, it tells you a lot about uh, the depth, width, and breadth of our medium. So I'm here with Dirk Stashke. Um, we are having a conversation about not necessarily just his work. These conversations tend to be free ranging. He and I will desperately try to avoid to make any political comments during the next uh, hour. And, um, but we will look into the work. We'll look into to creativity and we'll just exchange. Uh, we're both kind of veterans now. Uh, you're starting to look more like me every day. Thanks. I remember thing. you when you were a, a red-headed Viking. Mm -hmm. And um, now you, well, it's still there. Look closely in the light. There's a bit Barely. of ginger. Yeah, definitely a bit of ginger is still there. So your work recently um, is fascinating in a lot of ways. You are working between 2D and 3D. Uh, you're making old master paintings and sculpture at the same time. Uh, you're drawing from something which is almost a ancillary part of, of ceramics, which is the uh, still life. I mean, we know a lot about paintings from years gone by, I know a lot about ceramics from years gone by because of the paintings, because the focal point is very often a vase, a bowl. Um, and so you look at that painting, it's three, 400 years old, you assume that that was either a valuable piece, so it's being on show to say, look how important I have, I have a piece of Hispano Moresque pottery, mm -hmm. um, or else it was just something that came off the kitchen rack. <laughs> and was there and was available and sort of fit the composition. So you've gone into that world in a very interesting way. Um, when you first started to do the work, I found them difficult to read. Hmm. Um, it was clearly, it was so, it, it was very obvious what was being done. You were turning it into a sculptural work and the, um, um, the depth of it was traveling backwards from the frame. So it was an easy concept to understand, but I was surprised how many things in my brain were co rejecting it because it was challenging a very fixed concept about something. And um, probably when I started falling in love with it was when I saw the backside. And um, Ideally, in a viewing situation, uh, those pieces should be shown fixed upright. In the round. In the round, so you can walk around them. Because then when you see the abstraction that happens uh, in the back of the piece, you learn so much more about um, the composition. And if you start thinking of paintings that way, that you could walk around the painting and the painting could dimensionalize out mm -hmm. from the back. Um, it <coughs> was really a, a, a brilliant conceit to work with. Thank you. How did you get there? Ooh, um, in a macro sense, my work is about exploring that space in between painting and sculpture. Um, you know, if you look behind a painting, that illusion of space is lost. So I kind of view that as an opportunity or an attempt to give that a form. Mm -hmm. or, and um, it came about by a perfect sort of collision of different variables. Um, I've got some images that maybe I can give you later to show you that might help this. One of which was 
me growing tired of making actual still lifes that were just kind of piles of things. Yeah. Um, another was this really beautiful moment in my studio where I had just rolled out a slab of clay and I was cutting on it to use the slabs in a sculpture and I had a brand new canvas on there and what I realized as I had cut all these out after I pulled them off there was this beautiful perfect amazing drawing that was the happenstance of this other action mm -hmm. so there was a light that sort of went off how do I capture how do I incorporate that same sort of free happenstance that happens and then the third thing um, that was kind of happening at the same time as I was beginning to question skill and verisimilitude um, and those are things that have been hallmarks in my works you know I've been out of graduate school for 20 years and it's one of the things that depending on who's doing the judging you're either praised or punished severely for it um, so I kind of wanted to throw that sort of conundrum back at the mm -hmm. viewer and you know, feeling trapped in between how other people perceive it, and also just needing to move on, you know, and, and try something new. Um, so I started with creating um, boundaries for myself uh, in that I knew how to sculpt things perfectly. You know, I could make things that would fool the eye, temple l'oeil, and I wanted to create a situation to where I could not actually physically access both sides of the sculpture. So mm -hmm. the very first ones were these little boxes I made out of scrap wood. And I started making the paintings just from that side up. Um, and at first I didn't, wasn't sure what was going to happen, you know. Um, as I continued to make more of them, I got more of an educated guess. But what I initially wound up really keeping me coming back to those was, I hate to use the words ju juxtaposition of the front and the back. Yeah. Um, I had this, um, when I first started making these, I had my, you know, there was this best friend of mine, and I would send him work, images of the work, and he would show them to his then, I think, seven-year-old daughter, and we're such close friends that I'm known, you know, as Uncle Dirk. And uh, you know he's showing the works to the daughter, and she's you know she's seven, but she's oh the fronts are amazing, and I'm like well the backs, and he's like eh, well not so much. <laughs> so it's this interesting yeah. thing, yeah. you know how we're conditioned sort of, especially the uninitiated in art yeah. are conditioned to think what makes great is the ability to mimic. Yeah. So it's me actually trying to thoughtfully take apart that, um, that school of thought. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think um, would help with your work, because I'm sure a lot of it goes up against the wall, even though, yeah. I mean, so, after it's bought. Yeah, so, because um, it's easier to hang it, is um, it needs to come with a pedestal, flat piece of sheet, two poles going up that go through into the, um, into the piece. So you can take it, put it on a pedestal or table or whatever it is in your home, and you've got that access to three-dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Because um, I didn't appreciate your work until I started looking at the backside. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not a Freudian slip, by the way. but. <laughs> um, and that was when I began to, to, to understand. And um, uh, in fact, I'll even go so far as to say, when I first saw the work, I didn't like it because I thought it was clumsy. Because mm -hmm. it was, you know, big and fat and you know, all this stuff. And I thought, yeah, but it doesn't resolve itself because then you go to the back and it's not, you know. Um, but in fact, the back, back is very beautiful because as I say, the abstraction that happens in the back, mm -hmm. you've got the same thing as in, as in the front. Um, well, similar to the front. It's, mm -hmm. it's not mimicking it. It's coming out in a very strange way, like mm -hmm. a voice coming through something that distorts the voice. But um, 
And then the more that you spend time with both sides, the piece comes to life. Uh, when you put it on a wall, to me, um, and which is how I saw the work at first, um, I didn't like it because um, it seemed a very, um, and you know, excuse me using these words, but you know I like the work, so we're getting to a good place. But there seemed a clumsiness mm. to this, you know, taking something and making it real and pushing it back, and it, it just didn't work. And I say, then I started, uh, you sent me some slides, I spent more time looking at the backs and the fronts, and that's when I began to understand it. So um, from wearing the critic hat, you know, I don't ever want to see one of those pieces attached to the wall. Mm -hmm. This one's a little different, mm -hmm. the one upstairs, because it is, in fact, uh, you know, a two-dimensional piece. So if you flip it, it doesn't uh, tell you anything about what's on the front. So right. that it, that's no problem. And I think it's a lovely way to go that the painting that you achieved on that piece with the glaze is just mesmerizing. Thank you. Um, it ran, but it didn't run uncontrolled. You know, <laughs> it just got the right amount of ooze and slippage and that. So, but as I say, that's fine. We put it up against the wall. You wouldn't want to see the back because right. it doesn't have information. But um, don't ever let people show that work two dimensionally. And if you build a little unit to make it easy for them, you're also instructing them how you want the piece to be seen, mm -hmm. which is a problem for artists. <coughs> Adrian Sachs got so pissed off going to. <laughs> collectors' homes and seeing how they show his work, he would leave depressed, you know, because he would look and his pieces would look like crap, you know, they're next to things have no relationship with them, mm. they've got no space. So he started doing his major works, uh, he built a, um, a unit that was attached to the wall, but the pieces had, could come out of it, to force people to show his work in a, I wouldn't say respectful manner, mm -hmm. but in a manner that was appropriate to the piece. And so that way you take control um, over the theater that follows the making of your right. work. Or I could just preempt all of that and turn them into lamps ahead of time so that that way I know that they're going on somebody's end table. Um, that actually is not such a bad idea. <laughs> um, no, I don't want to see one of your pieces with a lampshade, but y y it's funny you said that because one of the things I think of when I see your work, and one can do it brilliantly these days, is light. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, you can have a light that big. I know. And it can. Um, do something with it. When I met Andrew Lord, um, who you, I'm sure you know his I work. Know yeah. Yeah. Um, well, he was working on, a, on his, his sort of Delft-inspired pieces then. He, he, a bit later, he started to uh, work on still lifes. Mm. So he would look at a painting by Matisse and then make the components similar but not the same. Again, it wasn't mimetic. Um, and then he would um, arrange lights in his studio and cast lights to get the same sort of sense of shadow and that, and then, and then in essence, mimic the uh, play of, of uh, light and shade. Mm -hmm. um, now, he didn't then sell you the lights with the piece after that it was done. But, um, you know, maybe light does have, uh, because of the depth, uh, the difficulty in lighting the pieces, and that wouldn't be a reason for doing it. And in fact, you sitting there thinking, if that's what he wants to do, he should make his own art. But, um, but you know what I mean. There's an element in which light could bring tremendous drama. I've started um, making pieces where there's little skylights mm -hmm. cut in the top, trying to direct yeah. that light in more dramatic ways. So these are things I've definitely been thinking yeah. about. And as far as going to collector's house, I've been very fortunate the last couple of years because most of these have gone to museums. So I know they're not going to show it in the corner, not most of the time anyways. So yeah. 
good problem to have. So, um, you, you've been doing this now. Things are going very well. You seem to have a good dealer. You don't have to it's, answer that question. It's correct. Yes. And it's working hard for you. The work is getting out there, mm -hmm. uh, which is difficult in this field. Yes. A, there's a lot of competition. B, the middle market is like the middle class. It's Shrinking. incredibly soft. Yeah. Incredibly soft. And so you need somebody skillful working for you, making sure that that happens. And so you've built a really great body of these pieces. Um, where do you feel it moving to, if it's moving at all? I mean, this is not an old series, so you don't have to move. But of course you do, because every piece you grow. And so, without giving too much away, what do you see happening? Um, well, the paintings were a movement away from the sculptures, but I'm still making both. Mm -hmm. I feel like they complement each other really well. Um, I've also started making some vases, which I feel are design oriented, even though you know they kind of cross that line between that you've talked about before, yeah. between design and fine art. Um, with the sculptures, I'm, I've got a bunch of ideas in mind. I'm basically thinking now, because um, originally I'll call it a contrivance, but not in a derogatory sense. Yeah. But that box was a contrivance that served a purpose of negating my ability to touch the back. Yeah. Um, and as I moved on from the box, I started inventing other ways you know, of having that front represent itself onto the back. So now I'm rethinking that yet again. I'm trying to figure out some more interesting ways um, of removing my control over the back. Yeah. And so that's kind of the game. I, um, you know, artists have really bad ups and downs. Um, and when you're up, if you can ride that wave, if you can find that sweet spot where you have more ideas than you can possibly execute, that is a wonderful yeah. place to be. And I feel, I'm, I'm feel like I'm there now. There is a degree of, of, of being responsible to an audience. You're not, um, doesn't mean you don't make what you want to make, but you need in some ways um, to, to keep them with you. And, you know, previously an artist could be, um, success wasn't necessarily important, but today you've got children. I mean, artists had children then, but they ran around the streets in ragged <laughs> clothes. Um, you've got children, you've got health care, the rest of it. Uh, if, if you don't have some pragmatism, you can't stay in business. And, you know, when I say this, you know, there's groans in the audience and all the rest of it. No. You it's know, true. Every, very few artists haven't had a little bit of an iron in that fire. Picasso had hundred irons in that fire. Uh, Rembrandt was an art dealer, you know. Well, what's interesting, relating to this and, and trying yeah. to continue it on, um, you and Chris Gustin were talking yesterday, and I was very fortunate enough to listen to the conversation, and uh, I was talking about how, because he was on that trajectory before yeah. he stopped working, and he threw everything out in the studio. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm relatively young, depending on who you ask, right? Yeah. But I feel like now I'm getting to the point to where, you know, I see retro of retro now, you yeah. know? And um, it was interesting, because that really resonated with me what he was talking about, because I had had a similar experience um, of being um, sought after outside of graduate school. And I was making this figurative work and it was selling and I was, to me, that was a lot of money at the time. And I continued making that body of work for five, six years. And then I changed what I was doing. And it was a um, solo show at the Wexler Gallery it was the first time this work was exhibited. And I think it was 2006. Mm -hmm. And um, people shall remain nameless, but there were 
So all of my old collectors uh, dropped me. And basically, everybody who wanted that old work wanted nothing to do with the new work. Yeah. And I was essentially starting from scratch. And it was very difficult. But in, in essence, at, at the end of everything, it was the best thing I ever could have done. Yeah. So you didn't answer the question. Which one? The question was, where do you, what's drawing you now? What's informing you? What, is there something coming from the side? Uh, you did partly. You said you wanted to work more with... Well, you asked where back. it was going. You didn't ask what was um, propelling me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because I just... Um, I stopped teaching when we moved to Portland, so about six, a little over six years ago. And it was the best thing for my work because it was draining a bit. And I wasn't even full-time. I was half-time. And... Um, Recently, I just had, um, there's a guy, Thomas Orr, who's a friend of mine who um, runs Ash Street Projects in, in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so I let them come into my studio, and I talked to them for a little bit, and it was good. And one of the things I told them was, stop looking at ceramics for your inspiration. Yeah. And if you're going to look at ceramics, make sure it's all people who are dead, you know, things that don't. Um, you know, try to try to pull from your life experiences. Try to pull from, um, you know, older art. Don't look at what's hot right now and imitate it. Um, and I, I see that as a real problem right now. Um, so for myself, personally, um, I'm drawing from, you know, Dutch Vanitas still life, uh, my own life experiences. And then uh, peculiar moments in the studio, you know, like I said, where like that, just doing that one thing gave me an idea. I think, you know, university in particular, I think, tends to tell students that there is an academic intellectual way of accessing their art. Um, and that can be part of it. Mm -hmm. But for many of them, that's the only entry point, and that's why the work becomes cold, because they go into the studio, make anything, you know, and it'll happen when it's working. And that's what makes it exciting, because once you know what works, you're simply making product after yeah. that, you know. Um, finding little variations on that to keep you excited yeah. is, you know, what keeps me coming back to the studio for sure. So you are going to stay with the um, still life for some time? Several more years, I would imagine. And you should. Yeah. Um, another thing that happens in our field too much is if you look at the careers of the greats, um, Picasso is really the most irritating artist ever lived because he set up expectations for an artist's career which almost nobody can follow. But even in his case, if you look at his career, he stayed with things longer than people realized. Mm. And the pressure again in, in a contemporary marketplace is, well, you showed that last year, well, what are you gonna show this year? And one of the frustrating things we had in the gallery was you show uh, a body of work for two years and it's barely beginning to gel and the artist jumps and says, oh, well, I'm bored with that. I'm going to mm -hmm, move on mm -hmm. now. And they haven't, they haven't peaked. Y you should be careful about when you peak. That's mm -hmm. when it's like good to leave. It's like an orgasm in that sense. <laughs> um, but um, so they haven't peaked. And you look at it and you think, but you've left me hungry. You, There's so much more you could do with There's so that. much more, yeah. and I want you to do that. But the pressure in the contemporary marketplace is a design pressure, you know. Spring collection, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. winter collection, well, actually it's just usually a, a summer, uh, a spring and an autumn collection. But aside from that, each collection is new. They have to come with completely new ideas. Mm -hmm. And so when you see artists doing that, that often kind of kills off a career by 40. I could see that. Because um, you're not going to have that many great ideas in your life, I'm sorry to say. Um, great ideas. Right. You know, you'll have lots of really interesting ideas, but when you hit something with a lot of power, you've got to give yourself the time to 
to go into the most murky elements of it. And, and as I say, the pressure is there for you to drop it as quickly as possible because the dealer doesn't want you to show what looks like the same work a second time. And that's their error. They should be on the floor saying, well, you know, this looks like last year's show, but look at this, mm -hmm. look at that. So if you're serious about the artist, you've got to have one of these too because it extends the dialogue from the previous work. Mm. But that's in a perfect world. And uh, The thing is, though, is having some form of wisdom acquired through making yeah. that allows you to recognize those moments. And I yeah. feel like only in the last couple of years do I feel like I've come in to that space. Yeah. And I got to admit, it feels really good to, because I'm not worried about where it's going. You know, it's, it's actually, it's quite the opposite. I have to call out some of the areas it wants to go and go, okay, now we should kind of keep it. Yeah here, directed a little more. Yeah. So I know that um, um, I have instructions from you, uh, my son, daughter-in-law, and uh, <laughs> granddaughter live in Portland, and you've warned me that there will be severe consequences <laughs> to coming into that town and not seeing you. And Shit. quite honestly, I, I can't. You had forgotten about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for us to get together again. Thank I you very it. much. This Garth, it's wonderful. always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Same for me.